Good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to speak at the meeting. I'm particularly grateful to Sheila for making this slot available to me. Now I'm going to take you through uh, my ideas on bacterial nomenclature in the age of genomics and specify the problem, take you through five recent case studies that I've been involved in and then drop with some conclusions. The problem of naming the unnamed is the starting point here. Genome-based taxonomy is a victim of its own success. So the database GTDB now documents over 85,000 species, but less than 20% of those have well-formed Latin names. The rest of them have hard to remember alphanumerical IDs. Uh, and you know, trying to remember SP01133303035, it's, it's, it's beyond human capability. They're not human friendly. My view is that all taxa should have names. Now, some people may disagree and say, well, it's, you know, just as with places on the earth, you know, you can just make do with coordinates. Uh, uh, you don't need a user-friendly uh, name. Uh, to, to provide a, a, a counter view, we have seen the rise of uh, the What Three Words app in recent times, where every place on the planet now does have a name consisting of What Three Words that are human-friendly. And I believe the same approach should apply to uh, to bacteria taxa. I agree that there, I can see that there may be dissenting voices there and say oh you only give it a name when you really characterized it but my view is that if you're laying out the, the land you've got to give everything a name. The problem is that with conventional approaches relying on descriptive names or names for people or places we're generating about a thousand new species names per year. So if we continued at that rate using this kind of approach We'd, we'd take 60 years or more to name all the unnamed taxa, by which time we'd have many millions of more taxa to name. So something has to change. We have to put our foot on the accelerator and come up with no, new ways of doing this. My first encounter with this problem came from studies on the chicken gut microbiome. Uh, Rachel Gilroy is shown there. So my postdoc did all the heavy lifting in terms of the sequencing and the bioinformatics. Ahara and Oren helped us with the nomenclature. The problem we had was when we'd analysed the chicken gut microbiome, we came up with hundreds of novel species or un and or unnamed species. And what I set out to do was provide a stable, clear, memorable nomenclature for novel species. Um, and what we did was we exploited the provision with the, within the um, uh, ICNP uh, to create over 600 well-formed Candidatus Latin binomials. And to do that, what we did was we used combinatorial use of dozens of Latin and Greek roots pertaining to poultry, guts, feces, microbes, um, and rolled that out across all of them. And you can see some of the protologues uh, of some of these listed there. Uh, and those names uh, have uh, made their way out into the NCBI database, into GTDB, they're now listed in LPSN. So this was a successful venture to create hundreds of new names in bulk uh, for that particular publication. One little uh, side issue is that we also did have 30 species that we had grown and wanted to name and we're still waiting for the last accession numbers of those 30 species uh, from culture collections more than three years on which holds the light up to the very slow process uh, of naming species using the conventional approach and giving them um, names withstanding. It's, it's, it's very slow. Next case study followed on from that. I said to Horan, um, why don't we just roll this combinatorial approach out much more widely and perhaps we can automate it. Um, and so we enlisted the help of my colleague Andrea Teletin, who's a bioinformatician. And what we did was we adopted an approach that was combinatorial where we mixed different or word components together in a combinatorial fashion. We automated the approach. Uh, we, we created a Python script called GAN uh, for a grand automated nomenclature tour um, uh, and rolled that out over lots of names uh, from lots of different contexts. And the key point was we made those names in advance. So we didn't need them at that time, but we thought, well, you might as well make the names and then you can bank them in a name warehouse, if you like, for future use. So for example here you can see with the horse you can come up with 10 roots from Latin and Greek that mean horse. You can have 10 roots that mean gut or intestine or feces or whatever. And we, we managed to come up with about 20 roots that mean microbe. So you could come up with about 2,000 new names for horse gut microbes. Um, 
uh, and, and we rolled this out we created uh, these uh, next million names uh, we did include in those million names many species epithets so uh, in terms of uh, genus names it was in the tens of thousands rather than uh, uh, millions but that project was well received the publication was well received but uh, I started to think about this and I thought well, this is a difficult problem if we're going to name everything ev even living in say the mammalian gut microbiotas if every one of them needed 10 unique genera, we're going to need 54,000 names, meaning gut microbe or dung microbe. Um, and there's not enough roots in Latin or Greek to allow us to do that. Now we can go in and be more specific and say, OK, we'll name the host as well as the actual location, the gut or whatever. But then you end up with these very long names like this, where you're specifying uh, all those things together to create uh, names that are distinctive enough. They're just too long and that conflicts with one of the principles in the code that says you must use names that are short and easy to use and agreeable. The other problem is that when you go for these descriptive names they're often imprecise or sometimes just plain inaccurate. So Rhodococcus equi doesn't just live in horses for example. Haemophilus influenzae doesn't cause influenza. And if we wanted to make accurate precise descriptive names at scale what you're going to have to do is reconstruct the metabolism and do exhaustive searches of metadata of a, well, that's an old figure there, but tens of thousands of species, maybe even hundreds of thousands of species as we go forward. And that's a non-trivial error prone task. So um, that also creates a problem. While ruminating on this problem, I, I, I wrote a piece here uh, where I sort of, how can we make, consider how do we make things simpler and easier? Um, I, this idea of linguistic pragmatism, where we obey the rules, but we treat some of the recommendations as merely optional and we, and we adopt simpler approaches. One of the problems uh, is that the resources we have are not great at the moment in terms of the, the, the names of new species are published in lists, but those lists are not machine readable. Um, they have all sorts of superscripts and uh, other notes added to them. It's very, very hard to, to actually parse that data into something useful. Um, and then when we look at databases for bacterial taxonomy, they fail to meet the FAIR criteria of findable, accessible, interoperative and reusable LPSN, which is, I have to say, absolutely fantastic result. It retains intellectual property, does not release all of its data. The names for life, which is actually where the links go from in the list, is actually a private company. Um, and so we're publishing names and then linking them to a private company. To me, this this doesn't seem acceptable and what I argued in that piece is we need resources for name cr creation and we need resources for name curation uh, going forward that uh, 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 meet these fair criteria and in terms of making things easier there's a lot of very arcane stuff goes on when names are published and here just I'm not going to go through all this in detail but here are some of the ways in which we can make this kind of thing easier so that we don't need so many linguistic emendations we don't need so much expert input into this process and a key point is that although the code specifies that you have to give a derivation of a name it doesn't specify that you have to give a complicated protologue with lots of latin in it um, and here are some examples where i've said well why don't we just have simpler alternatives because 99.9% .9 of microbiologists do not care about the gender or the uh, part of speech of a component of a name uh, and whether it comes from Latin or Greek. That, that, that's unimportant to them. They just want to have a quick uh, mnemonic. Okay, it means a caucus with cells in pairs. Yeah, okay, that's it. And so this was a, a summary chart from that particular paper uh, looking at the way I suspected we should move forward, propose that we should move forward. Um, I also suggested we could do arbitrary shortening so you know, we don't have to have a one-to-one -one correspondence between every letter and syllable uh, in the components we can we can s simplify them and that approach actually does go back to the time of Linnaeus of simplifying names like that but then uh, I started moving forward and thinking well actually if we're going to scale this to account for hundreds of thousands of names that are going to be needed in the future there aren't enough descriptive names as I pointed out we're going to start having to use arbitrary names so uh, with a, a couple of colleagues here Miguel and, and Nabil um, 
I uh, put uh, into place a system for creating names that looked like they were in Latin but actually weren't Latin they were just made up names but they complied with what we call the phonotactics the look and feel of Latin and we combined these um, with various endings uh, to create a huge set of arbitrary names and then replaced all of the um, alphanumeric placeholders in GTDB with well-formed Latinate names that comply with the um, requirements of the code. And uh, you know, in doing so, we, we preserve the look and feel of Latin. Um, we assigned candidatus names to over 65,000 taxa. Um, and most people who don't know Latin don't realize that these names are actually just made up. Uh, and there was this lively debate about whether names have to be in protologues that are part of the main part of a paper or you can't just put them in an Excel spreadsheet. So we created a greater than 10,000 page set of protologues in a traditional form to satisfy the traditionalists. Now these candidatus names have no standing under the current code, so any of the names created could be replaced with a descriptive name later on or by any other name. Uh, if someone grows one of these organisms, they can, they can rename it. So we're not forcing this on the community, we're just providing a resource that the community can use if it wants to. One thing that's been slightly vexatious is that the seek code, which was supposed to be a more progressive form of, of, a, of, a, of a nomenclature code uh, than, than the, the, the current code, um, decided not to allow arbitrary names, even though the use of arbitrary names goes back over 150 years in all the various ancestors of the current codes, um, going back to, uh, to, to the uh, 1860s. Um, so for me that is not a progressive step forward, that is um, control freakery on part of the seat code community. Last case study, I've just finished uh, a paper which I've submitted, is now under review, where I looked at uh, what the uh, International Code of Nomenclature of Prokaryotes says about naming um, prokaryotes after people, after using personal names. Uh, the current approach is uh, very biased, very Eurocentric, disjointed, it's actually in some cases misguided or erroneous let's say um, and so I've I put forward some uh, suggestions for changes and I created a, a coherent workflow where we could actually take 125,000 last names from PubMed and create 1.6 million genus names from them just to show how these things could be played out at scale going forward. So in conclusion we face the, prob the pressing problem of naming the unnamed. Um, the, prob the problem is that bacterial nomenclature seems intimidating but in fact the rules are fairly flexible when you look at them. Um, there's much scope for making this easier uh, but the use of descriptive names doesn't scale well and I propose that the future belongs to arbitrary user-friendly names which can be deployed at scale. Thank you very much.